All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to uh, have you here. Hopefully, you still have some energy after a long day. I'm sure you, uh, you've walked around and stuff. At least I'm tired uh, of all that stuff. But today um, and this afternoon, I want to talk about a very, very uh, interesting topic of mine. I'm totally fascinated with resiliency. Resiliency is the idea that failure always happen and that we should build application and systems to handle failures. Right? In fact, uh, in large-scale systems, you all build microservices nowadays. Some microservices might have 10, 20, 100 different services. It's very common when you have microservices, especially at large scale, that at any moment, some of them will fail. In fact, if you have four or five microservices, it's kind of normal to always operate uh, with all the services working, right? That's what we call full operational system. But once you go at tens or a few tens or hundreds or thousands of microservices, it's impossible, right? And we call this partial failure. Right? So we operate in partial failure. That means we still always operate, but we handle failure. And this is what we call resiliency. And I've been working on resiliency for about 10 years. Right? I joined AWS three years ago, but before that, I worked in kind of scaling and businesses and startups, and especially backend system on AWS. And in 2003, uh, in 2012, there's something very interesting that happened, and I'll talk a little bit about this later. But before we go into talking about resiliency in multi-region, I want to remind you a couple of stuff. What is very important when you talk about resiliency is to understand first availability. And availability is the time your service is going to be available for your customer. Availability doesn't mean reliable. You can be available and still returning an error. So I'm just talking about availability. So availability is the time your service will be up. And very common in the industry is to say our service are four nines or three to four nines available. Uh, that means yearly your system needs to tolerate 52 minutes of downtime. One of the big outages I had in my life, that was like six years ago, our alert system failed. Our escalation pass failed. That means 26 minutes it took for us between the system was down to actually receive alerts. And in fact, it was customer telling us, your system is experiencing issues. So the, just one outage, and we already had burned half of our credits. So I just want to show you those numbers because this is the most important thing. When you build a business and when you want to make a resilient system, you need to know how often it is to be available and how often it has to go down. Actually, this also tells you that you have very, very little time. That means you need to automate everything, OK? But I want to drill in particular in this one. This is availabilities in series. And when you have microservices, when you build apps, very often you put them in series. And there is this equation. Right? And this equation tells us that if part X of the system is 99% available, and it's in series with another system which is 99% available, the overall availability of the system actually goes down. Right? This is availability in series. And this is something that very often we forget. There is another one that is very, very important. And actually, that's the topic of this presentation. It's availability in parallel. And this equation is your best friend. Let me tell you something. If you have a system X, which is 99% available, and you put it in parallel, without doing almost any change on your application, you actually make it 4.9 available. If you make it three times in parallel, it becomes six nines available. You haven't done pretty much any change in the code. The only thing what you've done is actually deduplicating the application, making it in parallel. And this is really the first thing you need to understand when we talk about availability and resiliency. And it's also the very reason why in the cloud we always architect around regions and AZ. 
Let me talk a little bit how we define at AWS a region. So we have in AWS about 18 regions worldwide. A region is actually a set of availability zones. Now it's a common mistake to think in one availability zone, there's one data center. There's not. There's one to many. It's actually some of the biggest regions can have up to five data center per availability zones, right? And some of the very big regions can have 15 or plus 20 data centers within one region. And we organize those AZ so that they are physically separated. They are physically separated so that they also have a different electrical grid, a different flood plane, a different fire plane, so that in case of a problem in one AZ, the same region will continue running because we have other AZ available. Right? And in one region, there are usually three AZ up to, up to six. Okay? So when you open an AWS account and you select a region, you are given a set of availability zones on where you should deploy an application. And this is also the reason why we always, always tell our customers to architect their solution across multi-AZ. Actually, the first thing you should do when you have an application is really deploy it so that it works across multiple availability zones. When you do this, there's few requirements that you need on the application. One of the most important requirements is that your application is stateless, right? So that if an application is treated with one AZ, the other request can take and continue the job, right? So they share the states between different AZ. So that means your application does not store the state locally, it stores the state within the region. And that's really the first level of designing an application which is highly available and resilient in the cloud. How many of you are already doing this today? All right, so a lot of you. Now there's the next level. And the next level is doing multi-region. And this is really the topic of this presentation. And you might be wondering, why do we do multi-region? There's few reasons, and we'll go through them later. But what is very important here is to understand that even if you go multi-region, there's a lot of work to do. Usually, you need a DNS, right? a DNS with a C name, and then a policy which will distribute traffic between different regions. Right? So what you did is you just took an application in one region and copy-pasted and duplicated inside the second region. OK? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we have about 18 different regions. So when you want to do a multi-region, you can really almost architect your application across 18 different regions. I'm not going to demo that today. Today, I will demo you across two regions. And we have 18 regions with 55 ability zones. So that gives you a lot, a lot of places where you want to deploy your application. So why would we want to build multi-region backend? Well, the first region, or the first important thing is to understand latency. I'm sure you all have heard the word latency. Latency is the time it takes for a packet to go from one place to another. Okay? And that's latency in electrical fibers or in optical fibers is actually bound by the speed of light. And the speed of light, no one yet has hacked it. Right? So when you take a region and you want to deploy services, for example, in Europe, and you have users in US, your users will automatically have a latency of about 140 milliseconds per direction. So that means a round trip will be 300 milliseconds. Now, if I tell you that we did some tests on Amazon.com, the retail website, and adding 100 milliseconds latency on the page has an effect of 1% drop in sales. How many of you can detect 100 milliseconds? No one. In fact, the human, a very fast human, can go 250 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. Average person is 400 milliseconds. But that means your unconscious mind will detect 100 milliseconds. And you will feel, naturally, the feeling, or you will have the feeling that the application is not responsive, is not fast, and you'll just get bored and move on. And 100 milliseconds is not something you can do by feelings. 
is something you detect by test and data. And trust me, at the scale of Amazon, 1% drop in sales is a lot of money. Okay? So 100 milliseconds is a lot. So when you deploy your application globally, that's one of the most important reasons. It's actually, 10 years ago, it was very common for application for companies to have local applications, right? It was not common to have a global reach. Nowadays, when you launch an application or when you launch an app, you want to reach almost the global market. When you put your application on the, in iPhone or Android or Windows phone, they have a marketplace, and users from pretty much all over the world can download that. And you don't want your user to experience 600 milliseconds latency if your users are in Australia and you are in Europe, right? So there's an incentive to really start deploying application across the world. So this is one of the most common reasons why people start to have multi-region systems. Another very important one is disaster recovery. Disaster recovery, that means you have a primary region. And the other one is passive. And we call that setup active passive. So that means one region takes all the traffic, and the other one, in case of a failures, in a service in one region will actually generate a switch of traffic to the other region, okay? So the passive regions all of a sudden become active. And this we call disaster recovery, and some customers have done that for a long time. Now the problem with such a setup, it takes a long time to actually move the traffic from one active to one passive. And especially, it takes a long time to warm up this region. And the problem with passive is very often the cache, the queue, the messaging, all the systems that you need to operate in a very large scale will have to warm up. And when they warm up, you have a possibility, possibility to have a very big outage because it's something that is not tested very often. So going from the uh, 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 passive to active as a potential for a big outage, simply because this is not practiced often. So what we want is really to have a system where pretty much both regions are working at the same time, and we just have to switch traffic from one to another, and then scale the other one to handle the traffic here. And this is what we call active-active. And back in the day, having an active-active architecture was very, very difficult, okay? And I'll explain you why. In 2012, actually, Eve Christmas of 2012, Netflix experienced an outage, and it, the service of Netflix went down for a few hours. And the problem here is Netflix was not responsible. In fact, in, in fact Netflix, Netflix is on AWS, 100% using AWS for the service, and they've been doing that for a long time. But on the eve of Christmas 2012, one of the load balancers in the region, US is one, experienced some issues. And it created a cascading effect that took the service down for a few hours. And Netflix couldn't do anything because the load balancer were Amazon or AWS responsibility. We've now have fixed all the issues, but at that time, Netflix thought that this can't be. Because if you are competing with the normal broadcast, people open the TV and it works, right? So Netflix want the same experience for the users. They don't want to say, oh, it's over the internet. We can be down a few hours and that's it. They want that every time you actually play a movie on Netflix, it will work. So they decided in 2013 to do the first multi-region active active system. And back in the day, it was very, very difficult. There was no managed services, so they had to do a lot of engineering work, like replicating databases, replicating bin logs, synchronously between regions, maintaining connections between regions, and all that over the internet. And when you do this over the internet, you are at the mercy of change of traffic patterns. Latency change is not consistent, so it was really a big engineering work. And took big team of uh, engineers and few months to be able to achieve that. And they haven't stopped there. In fact, in 2016, 
they open services in Europe, right? And now many of you are probably consuming Netflix, right? And because they wanted you to have a low latency experience, they actually started to have a region in Europe. So now they have three active regions. They have two regions in the US, East, West, and one in Europe. Uh, so Netflix has the kind of architectures that we're going to talk today. And to test those architectures, your unit test or functional testing and integration testing actually don't work very, very well anymore. Because those are very good for a single region isolated application. But when you talk about the distributed systems, you have to take into account a lot of different problems. And to be able to test these multi-region architectures, they created some tools called the Chaos Monkey. How many of you have heard Chaos Monkeys? Yeah. So Chaos Monkeys are cool, cool little monkeys. They're actually software system that you launch or use in your application, and they will just randomly kill stuff. They will randomly break things to see if the system recovers, self-heal, and starts, and so that your consumer and people can consume their service. If you're interested in doing this, I actually have a full talk tomorrow on chaos engineering, so please come back. But this is actually pretty cool. Now let's talk about how do we actually build those systems. So there's a few things that you have to understand. When you go multi-region, you are breaking the barrier of synchronous replication. In fact, we say that to have a synchronous replication, we have to be under five milliseconds separation between components. And you've, heard, you've seen the latency between regions is usually 100 milliseconds to 300 or even more. So when you go multi-region, you go into the realm of what we call asynchronous systems, and you just don't have a choice. Right? You cannot go around this. You have to handle asynchronous systems. Now it doesn't mean that the entire system needs to be asynchronous, but it means most of your operation will have to be asynchronous. Because if you have to be synchronous, you usually have locking systems, right? And when you go asynchronous, you enter what we call the realm of the CAP theorem. How many of you know the CAP theorem? Uh, if you go into software engineering, it's very often a problem that comes into mind. The CAP theorem just says that in the presence of a partition, so a place where you want to store data, in a distributed system, you have to make a choice between consistency, so that means being able to have the same data on each and every place in your system at the same time, or being available, having the data available at any time. When you have a consistent system and you inject system in this one, you usually have to lock it and then replicate the data and then release it. And that locks makes these nodes not available, right? Because you want strong consistency. But in a distributed system, usually 90% of the time, or even more, we want to be highly available. So that means you want to be able to write in a node here, in this node here, and here at the same time. And you want to be able to read at the same time, regardless of the consistency. And when you do this, all of a sudden, you make another very important decision. It's called eventual consistency. And eventual consistency means that at any given time in your system, you might have different version of the same data in every node. So for example, if I have a value of A and I put two on it, after a certain moment of time, maybe 10 seconds, or a bit less, let's say 100 milliseconds, I'm going to add A equal to in all the nodes, OK? Now, let's say I make an update on A. I make an update on A, and I give A equal 5. Imagine I read A here right after I put B, uh, A5 here. Well, it might return actually the previous value, because maybe the replication hasn't happened, right? And we call this eventual consistency. It means that after a particular certain amount of time, all the nodes will have that value. And that also means that when you design UI and application, you need to have this in mind. Right? You cannot expect 
all your user experience and your UI to be strongly consistent. And this is one of the biggest problems in applications that want to handle multi-region systems. So embrace eventual consistency. Now, when you want to do replication across multi-region, there's something very important to do. You notice Netflix took many years to be, or many months to design their architectures, right? That's because the traffic back in the days was going from one region to another across the internet. And this is something that was a problem both for Netflix and actually for us. When we deploy services, when we deploy a region, when we maintain services, we actually use a lot of cross-region uh, deployments. And in 2016, to be able to uh, control this latency between different regions, we actually built a full global network of our own fibers, okay? And it's a network that actually links all the region together through direct connection. Actually, dual 200, uh, the dual 100 gigs network circle around all our region. So that now, if you want to send traffic between one region to another, it's actually not over the internet, but over our network. It's encrypted, and it's especially going through a system where we control the latency, we can control the error rate, and we can make it as performant as we want. Now, having that gives you the possibility to do one thing very nice. A few years ago, when you wanted to link regions between each other, you had to have what we call VPN appliance between regions, right? And that was going over the internet, and very often you had to have two of them because you want to be res resilient, so you need to have two in case one goes down. That's a lot of operation. Since we launched the global network, now you can link every region through what we call VPC peering. So you have a VPC, a network configuration in one region, right? And then you can link it through a peer connection to another region with one click. All right, so you don't have any more to duplicate uh, appliances, VPN connection. You don't have to maintain them, make sure that they are up, sending traffic, time, all this kind of stuff that is very, very annoying and complicated to do. So that gives you a lot more time to actually work on your business. So that's a good thing, and we launched that last year. Another thing that has become possible with uh, the global network is cross-region replication. Right? Cross-replication on S3. S3 is our storage, object storage uh, service, where you can put a lot of data, files, or videos, or JavaScript, anything what you want. And when you put this in an S3 bucket, traditionally, we never ever move that data out of the region. But now, if you want, and only if you want, you can enable cross-region replication. And that means you take a bucket and you say, as soon as you put data in this bucket, we will asynchronously replicate that same data into any other region. This is very good for data uh, disaster recovery, but also for active-active system. Of course, it also means that you will have a latency between the data available here and here. But we call that eventual consistency. And as I said, it's something you anyway have to deal with it. The way you could avoid that is storing do two put into all the region or make a put in all the region, but it's not very, very friendly. Right? So just embrace eventual consistency and handle this uh, asynchronous replication. And this is a very, very common way to move data from one region to another. Now there's another thing that uh, has been made possible. Having, how many of you are using RDS currently is our managed uh, database? So RDS is our relational database sys service. And it's managed. So we give you uh, a managed cluster. You can have a master. And you can have what we call read replicas. Read replicas are really good because if you want to scale an application, you can move the traffic from the write to the read. So that means your master will handle only the writes, and the read replicas can handle all the reads. RDS handles five different replicas. If you use the Aurora engine of RDS, it can handle 15 of them. So you really, really can shard your reads and your writes and scale very much. 
But until last year, the re replicas were only within one region. Right? Now, if you want to go global and you have a relational database, you can have cross-region read replicas. All right? So that means that the data that you put into a master will be asynchronously replicated to all the replicas that you have deployed in other regions. That gives you a capability to scale the reads to the region. But that also has a little bit weird anti-pattern, right? And I'm sure you all notice is that I only have one master. So if I have a user that is using the system, it can read very fast because it's close to the reads, right? It's close to the read replica. But if he wants to write a write, he needs to do what we call a cross-region write, which is an anti-pattern. But that's the way to do it, because this is transactional database. So our customers said, OK, but that's not really, really cool. So we announced, actually, that now you will be able and very soon be able to handle what we call multi-master and multi-region. Right? And we are going to release Aurora with capability to have first multi-master within one region and then multi-master across different regions. So that means your application will be able to write and read from any region. Okay? And this is a capability that is going to come within 2019. So there is not much time. So just uh, check up the, uh, what's happening soon. But that's a very, very good capability. Now, if you are a little bit impatient, you might have heard of DynamoDB. How many of you have heard DynamoDB? So DynamoDB is our NoSQL database. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's actually a project that we launched in the mid-2000, uh, so 2007, 2009. Uh, Amazon.com was trying to scale, and we had a lot of issues with scaling our transactional database. We were running Oracle database back in the days, and we couldn't scale them up anymore. So the traffic was jamming. It was not a good user experience. When we uh, listened or when we did an audit of all the, relation, uh, the, all the database uh, queries, what we realized is 70% of our queries were non-transactional. And we were using transactional database with 70% of our query non-transactional. First lesson here is actually audit your queries, because very often we think queries are transactional when, in fact, they're not. The second thing is we went into building a system called Dynamo, which would allow us to scale. So we moved many of our system to Dynamo transitionally, and now most of Amazon.com is running both on Amazon uh, DynamoDB and uh, Aurora RDS. And DynamoDB, if you wonder if it scales, just let me give you a couple of numbers. You know Prime Day. Prime Day is a day in the year where we actually open the gate. We give a lot of uh, 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 sales, so you have a lot of uh, people coming and buy. And this is a time of the year where the traffic grows dramatically. And we use DynamoDB to scale. Right? And it was handling 13 million requests per second at peak. Right? This is DynamoDB. Okay? It's 13 million requests per second. It's kind of a big deal. Actually, in all my career, I've never seen a system handling that much uh, traffic at peak time. Okay? And DynamoDB just released uh, released few, uh, few, uh, few months ago, actually, I think 12, uh, 11 months ago, a system called DynamoDB Stream. DynamoDB Stream is a way to capture changes within DynamoDB. So if you write into your table, we output out of DynamoDB a stream of information of everything what you've done in the table. So the reads, the writes, the updates. And then you can capture that with a Lambda function, for example, and do uh, computing on top of this. And when we launched this, a lot of folks started to use that system to replicate data from one DynamoDB table to another. Right? So we thought, OK, let's make this simple uh, for our customers. So we launched something called Global Tables. And this is already uh, generally available. Everyone can use this. And this is a multi-master, multi-region endpoint for DynamoDB. So that means that you have a global table that is 
available in most of the region that you can access anywhere. You can write and read anywhere around the world. And this is going to be actually the main uh, tool that I will use for the demos, because we're going to do some demos. I'm going to build one architecture from scratch with you. Uh, uh, Global Table is actually very good for distributed application. Bear in mind that the replication is asynchronous, so you need to, and global table is eventual consistent. We don't have strong consistency, so that means you cannot lock a table in one region and wait for the data to be replicated everywhere. So it's eventual consistent. So when you design your app, it needs to handle eventual consistency. But eventually, all the data in the nodes will converge to the same, same value. And it's used in a lot of scenarios. So now folks started to use it for disaster recovery, but actually a lot for active-active architecture. When you go uh, multi-region, there is very uh, important tool that you need to use. And that's what we call a load balancer. Uh, but you don't want to load balance within one region. You want to load balance within multiple regions. So we have to balance the traffic on the DNS level. Right? So you have a DNS request, and then we move the traffic from one region to another. And to do this, you need to have what we call routing, or routing policies. Sorry, my French accent. When you have routing policies, you have a few scenarios. One is called latency-based routing. And this is what we call, right? It's going to prioritize for the lowest possible latency. So that means if I have resources in one region or another, we're always going to send the traffic to the lowest latency or the tool for that particular user. So if I'm a user in the US and the region is in the US, here is going to go there. If I have another region in Europe, the latency is going to be over 130 milliseconds. So we're not going to send the traffic there. But it's only latency based. And latency can change, right? So you can have sometimes resource B and A that has different value. And maybe at a different time, this one might have a bigger latency than this one. But this is a very good uh, uh, policy to have the best and fast uh, latency. And this is a policy that is often used for gaming companies where latency is very, very important. Another policy is called GeoDNS policy. So that means you DNS or you route the traffic based on the location of a user. Uh, if my user in the US, I will automatically route the traffic to the US region. Uh, because I'm a user in the US, I will be there. And it doesn't necessarily follow the latency. So I can sometimes have stronger latency here, but since my location is US, the traffic will always be going there. And this is a very good uh, routing policy if you have strong uh, compliance requirement, or if you want, for example, that European users are only in database in Europe, or US users are only in database in US. So this system is also used a lot for this kind of operation. And then you have what we call weighted round robin. A weighted round robin is like ping pong. It's like you go from one to another, and you can affect, affect the traffic. So your request will go one, and then the other, and then one, and then the other. And in case, uh, and the fourth one, sorry, the fourth one is failover. And if you have any of those three policies in use, and all of a sudden, one of the resources or one of the regions has issues with one of the services, it will call what we call a failure. So you have a DNS failover. So that means my entire traffic will move to one region. So you can combine active, active with DNS failover. So that's kind of the perfect scenarios for us, right? So another feature that we launched about eight months ago, it's called support for custom domain names. So API Gateway is a service that you can put in front of Lambda, EC2 instance, or containers, and that gives you an API endpoint, a way to manage your API, a way to uh, have staging, a way to have throttling, all this kind of functionality. But when we launched API Gateway, it didn't support custom domain. 
So we had, we gave by default a domain name to the, to the API endpoint. And obviously, if you have a different domain in your API endpoint than you have in your DNS, you have CN, uh, C, uh, C names mismatch, so you can't have this kind of routing. So we launched what we call support for custom domain names. So that means now you can take the same domain name that you will have for your uh, DNS and use it for your endpoints. And now we have a capability to do all of a sudden serverless, multi-region, active, active ser uh, architectures, OK? So that will be the demo. Demo will do something like this. So we're going to have a, a, a domain. So it's called global addon.me. And I will be one user. I will send some API requests to two regions. My regions are identical. They have one API gateway with some Lambda functions that support a bunch of different API, a get, a post, and a health check. And then I'm using DynamoDB global table to replicate the data asynchronously between two regions. So that means if I, can, if I make a request right here, and then I made a read here, I should be able to see the value. Okay? So I'm just going to show you how to do this. So I'll get off the slides, and uh, let's start building some global table. So this is the, this is the console for uh, DynamoDB. So when you go onto the AWS console and you want to create a table, you can do something like this, create table. And let's give it a name. So let's call it Lisbon, Lisbon demo. And let's give it a partition key. So let's call this item ID. And this is all I need to create a table. A table uh, in DynamoDB needs a name and a primary key. A primary key is a way to address a particular item in a table. Okay? So for example, uh, here I'm going to store some integer or some string. And actually, this is a string. So I'm going to store a string. And I'll be able to call this item by this ID. When you do a global table, the global table uh, currently has to have zero data into it. Eventually, you'll be able to migrate DynamoDB table to a global table. But currently, when you start a global table, it needs to be empty. So now I have my table called Lisbon. And you see there are zero items in there. And if you go into the console, there is this little uh, tab here called global table. And when you uh, click on it, you see that actually that message. And this is the stream, the DynamoDB streams that I talked about, which is actually the service that take a, a particular uh, event on the database and replicate this in a stream that is outputting outside the database. So when you want to use uh, global tables, you need to enable streams. So let's enable stream. Enable stream will take the new object and the old object, so you have all the information. And now I can start creating what we call a global table. And I can start to add regions to it. So when you do this, you just select the region in where you want to have uh, the replica, so the DynamoDB replica. Here, uh, we have created the region in Oregon. So let's uh, have another region, let's say, in uh, Virginia. And then I can proceed, and that's it. So now, my table is being replicated into another region. And that's pretty much it. It takes a couple of seconds, and then I can start operating to it. And when you do this, uh, by default, you get five read capacity and five uh, write capacity. But actually, you can enable auto scaling if you want and have that uh, automatically scale up on your traffic. Now, you can see I can go on the table there. And now I, uh, I have my table here called Lisbon Demo. And this is in Oregon. And then I will have a Lisbon demo in Virginia. Okay? So now my table my, is global between two regions. If you want, you could definitely add more, uh, uh, more regions. Actually, you can add all the regions, and you can support pretty, me, uh, pretty much all that. Now, when you add a region, you have to bear in mind that you also augment the number of write and read. So it will be more costly. Okay? So, only add region into the regions that you really need. So let's, uh, let's test that. So I have two uh, tables in, 
in two regions, one Oregon. So now I can start to add items. So let's create an item and let's call that foobar because foobar is the most popular idea we can have. So now I have an item uh, in the database and you see when I create an item, it actually adds fields to it. Those I didn't add the fields, it were added by the global table. And this is the origin, origin of the object. Okay, so West 2, which is Oregon. And this is the time at which the object was installed. And now if I go into the other region, it will have the item in the table. So you can click on the item and you'll see I have now the item in both regions, right? It's full bar. So then you can also start from the, uh, 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 the other, other side, so bar foo, and then let's do that, and then let's go straight here and see if this has been replicated, and you see the item now is in global table. And this is between two regions, it's about 150 second latency, so now you're able to read and write from any region. So if you look at this, now I have that built, okay? Any question with global table to start with? It's good. You can add as many regions as you want, okay? So now let's, oh sorry, let's uh, create what we call the API endpoint with the Lambda functions. And to do this, I created, I created uh, a serverless, a serverless, a serverless uh, template. So I'm using the serverless framework. How many of you uh, know the serverless framework? So when you, uh, uh, when you build serverless application, you have the possibility to uh, use a bunch of different serverless uh, framework. I started to uh, build uh, stuff using the serverless framework, but you can use uh, SAM, CLI, you can use Sparta, depending on the language that you want to use. And a serverless templates, you uh, define your API using a template. Right? It's a, a template that is built in YAML, and you I have the name of the service on top. It's called blog version two. I can uh, see the provider here. Uh, serverless uh, supports different clouds. So you, for this demo, we do AWS. Then I can define the, the security groups that I want, the memory, uh, the environment. And you see here, I'm using uh, variables like this. So that means I'm taking uh, environment variables from a file, and my file is this one and I have a value called status, okay? So basically, I deploy uh, an environment with some environment variable called 200. Then I can have a lot of uh, stuff, so this is the resources that I want, uh, and give it uh, some security and roles, define some actions, but the most important here is this function. So I have three functions which are gonna be deploying Lambda. Lambda is a serverless function that you allows you to run uh, code, just the function. You don't have to deploy the entire instance or anything. You just give it a function and it will run it. I have uh, three functions, one called get, another one called post, and another one called health. This is to store data in the DynamoDB. This is, uh, this is to store data into DynamoDB. This is to get this uh, item that I store. And this is to check a health. And when you do routing, you know we uh, talked about the DNS failover. To, to understand if a resource is working or if a region is working, you need to support what we call health checks. The health checks that I build here is very, very simple. It's simply returning the status, right? It's simply returning 200. So by default, when I'm gonna deploy that, it's just returning 200. I want to demo to you the failover. So at some point, I will switch that to 400. It will return an error, so we can have all the traffic move from one region to another, okay? This is the purpose of the status. My post function is taking uh, input, like an item ID. Here, it has also a body, uh, takes the item ID and extracts the session comment and the item ID from uh, the body of the message, and then stores this into uh, DynamoDB. So my, I put the items and when uh, item ID and then session comment into my global table. I have another then get item. A get item takes the ID that I want to retrieve and then extracts this from Dynamo. So table, get item. And you can, you can set up your DynamoDB table uh, like this, your resource, 
This is just a hack, right? It's not necessarily production code. It's just to give you an idea of how this works. So I have now uh, a get, a post, and a health. And then I can deploy this in two regions. So you see I'm supporting uh, US 1 and US 2. So when I do uh, my serverless queries, when I go there, so for example, let me go into my project. Whoa. Good. Where is my project? Here, so what I can do, I can do something called uh, a query is called serverless deploy, and I can define in which region I want my template to be deployed. So just for the sake of it, let's do uh, deploy US East. So what it does, it takes the templates, takes the Lambda functions, and then start deploying the Lambda function in one region. Uh, here, the US East. And you see this template is just taking this, is going through all that, take, packaging this, and then uh, packaging all the Lambda function into, uh, into a package, and then deploying this uh, to uh, Lambda. So when this is done, then uh, this gives me basically an endpoint like this. Uh, and I can start doing something called, uh, let's do an HTTP. Do you see in the background? No. So you can do something like this. And then I'll give, oh, what did I do? Oh. It's the wrong endpoint. I don't want that. Why does it do this? Yeah. And I'll create an uh, item ID. And I'll give, you, give it the name uh, Fufu Bar. And what it does is now it's taken my object and actually stored that into my table. So if I go inside my global to table, I uh, have an item now called fufu bar. And this was just deployed now. Uh, so that means my deployment uh, has worked, OK? And just to show you, because I changed the name of the table, is in this demo, I'm just using a table called global2, OK? So then I can do the same into the other region. I can do SLS deploy and do this into US2. And then I'll have endpoints in both regions, right? So let's uh, leave it uh, do that. So I want to show you basically what has been deployed. So I have, this is my, uh, uh, my Lambda uh, service in AWS in the console. So you can see I have, uh, I have a bunch of Lambda functions here. And uh, then uh, I, can, I can sort them. So I have a bunch of... Uh, uh, of services. The ones I'm interested in is my services called block v2. Right? That's the name of the service that I was in the template. So you remember, uh, you remember the template here, block v2. This is the name of our service. So all my functions will have uh, block v2 and then the name of the function. And then I have the functions here. So you can start uh, seeing the functions. And what it does is it shows me that my function is actually linked to API Gateway. This is good because I give it an endpoint in the, inside this template. And then it supports uh, X-Ray, CloudWatch, DynamoDB, and also EC2. So there's a lot of stuff that I've been enabled. But what is most important is you remember this uh, status environment variable, right? So you see my environment variable has been deployed. So that now means that uh, this function will return 200, OK? So when I will uh, probe that through an else check, it will always return 200. I can change that value a bit later, but first I want that to return 200. So I have all my Lambda functions that have been deployed. So you see uh, this now has been deployed into another API. It's called RCP, OK? And then this one is 3VOX. OK, so now I have a system that is, uh, that is like this. Let me show you the slides so that you have it. Uh, this is my DynamoDB global table. So now I have something like this, OK? And the API Gateway. This is now what we have. We have deployed the API Gateway with the Lambda functions in both regions. 
And you can go and check actually in the console also that your API gateway is uh, correctly deployed. So here's my API gateway. And you see I have my dev block 2 API that is being deployed in Oregon. And I also have another one that is in Virginia. So if I go in Virginia, you'll be able to see the same API endpoint there. Okay. So here I have my API gateway there. And you see my API gateway supports the path that I've designed. So create. Uh, this is the post function. It has the get to get the item and the health, which is also a get. So now I have both systems deployed uh, globally. So this is uh, what we have. But now that's not enough. Okay? So what we need is really uh, to have a routing policy between different systems. So now let's, uh, let's uh, back up. So I have a, a domain name. This is my, uh, this is my own uh, add-on.me. And what I do, uh, what I did there, I created a C name called uh, global, oh, uh, global add-on.me. You see, when you look at it, it's actually I've defined uh, an endpoint called global addon.me, and what it uses is it uses a traffic policy. All right? And my traffic policy is called globe blog. All right, so let's go and have a look what that is. And we saw the traffic policy is what it does uh, to route or to balance traffic between regions. So you had the weighted round robin, you had the latency based routing or you had the uh, geolocation-based routing. So here, what I've done is I created what we call a weighted round-robin policy. So I have uh, two weights of 50. Do you see in the end of the room? It's good. So I have two weights. So that means I will balance the load between the two regions, 50% and 50%. And I'm adding health checks, OK? And the health check will target the lambda function that returns 200, OK? This two uh, policy, they go and target two endpoints. And the endpoints with value called D and D. And this is OK. This is not the endpoint that we had for uh, uh, API Gateway. And you're right. Actually, when you uh, deploy API Gateway, uh, you see it has, it has an API that is very different than what we had what we have in this target, right? And this is because you're here using the normal C name of the API gateway. But we want to use a custom domain. So when you are in API gateway and you want to go global, you need to use what we call custom domain. And here, you see, I imported my certificate add-on.me and with the C name global. And I assigned this to my API gateway. OK, so now my API gateway, you can see the path. What it takes, it takes my API gateway, and then I can start routing traffic with the right uh, uh, C name. So that means now I can really have a policy to, uh, between that target. This is the target domain name in one region and the other. And this is. The target name is the one that you use in the routing policies. Okay? So when Route 53 will route traffic, it will route traffic to the different target names. Okay? So now I have the system pretty much ready. Right? So let's have a look at the health check. Because now my health check is supposedly returning to 100. So when you create, uh, sorry, when you create a health check, let's create one from scratch so that you know, uh, you know a little bit what it is. You give it a name, so for example, uh, test. You define what it is, and here you can give it a cost, uh, domain name. Okay, and when you do a domain name, you can see also advanced configuration, and this is what I want to show you. You can have request on your health check every 30 seconds or every 10 seconds. Okay, the most important is what we call failure threshold. A failure threshold is the number of time my health check will have to return uh, error to believe that this is actually down. Okay? And this is done to avoid uh, intermittent errors. In distributed, in distributed system, one of the biggest problems is errors that are not real. 
right? Because you have such a big network, this goes over the internet, so at any given time, you can have a network error. It doesn't mean the system is down, it just means maybe your, time, your request is gonna time out that didn't go, didn't go through. So you don't want necessarily to overreact. And this is a very, very important thing when you do DNS failover, do not overreact because you will have intermittent errors. So you need to figure out in your system what kind of errors you're willing to accept before believing that the system is actually experiencing real issue. And here, we are, we are in actually the system I have, we're doing a fast, check, uh, a fast check, so every 10 seconds, and I will have a threshold of one. So that means at the first errors, I will overreact, which is absolutely what not you should do, okay? So <laughs> do not do that. But I want a demo, so I want the thing to fail fast. So I created two health check, okay? And the health check, what they do is they target this URL, which is my API gateway, and it calls dev check, okay? So now I'm targeting the API gateway. I say, if you uh, have uh, errors, then failovers. And it's a fast one, 10 seconds with a failure, uh, failure threshold of one. And both are like this. And now you can see, actually, that all the health checkers are returning 200, okay? So this is the health check of US East. So that means uh, Virginia. So let's now go and break the whole thing. Actually, no, let's make a request first on the system to show that the data is gonna be replicated. Uh, I don't want, I love breaking things, so that's the problem. So let's first actually uh, create a tab. And then let's send some data into, into that. So uh, what I'm doing here, um, I'm doing a for loop between 0 and 70. And for each of the i between 0 and 70, I create an item called foobar.0124567. Okay? So I'm going to post a lot of data there. And there it is. What I'm doing is I'm going to create another tab as well. And uh, I'll explain you why. So when you do requests like this in HTTP, your local machine actually is, lock, is uh, caching the DNS resolver. So sometimes you have stickiness uh, on that query. So what you need to do is create two threads. So now I have a lot of items that is being created into DynamoDB. So I can do uh, then into the console, and you'll see in my table called global, I'm going to start adding items that has been created from a lot of different regions. So you see now items at west, east, west, east. So it goes a bit, uh, uh, well, in this case, like this. And this is something that is very important to realize is when you have routing policy 50-50, it doesn't mean that it's one here, one here, one there. It's after about 1,000 requests, eventually the load will uh, balance across both regions. So this is the first thing that you need to uh, realize. So that's why I don't necessarily have a, um, a wide range of US and West. But you see, for example, here, I do have some East, I do have some West. So you see, uh, let's go, I have a bunch more items. So I can have, I have some East, you see here, and then I have some West at the end, okay? So, Eventually, I have 50-50 between uh, this. So now my traffic is really uh, distributed between two regions. So let's go and see. Uh, OK, this has stopped. This has stopped. So now let's delete all the items here in the database. Yep, 100 items, yes. And then the next 70, oh, the next uh, 40, sorry, 28. 70, 70, 140. Something is wrong. Ah, there you go. Let's delete everything. There, now we have 140. Okay, so all my data has been deleted uh, in all the regions. Okay, so now my region is empty of data. Okay, we're all clear. We are empty of data, and all my health checks return 200. So now let's break stuff. So let's put here a 400. And let's save this. And let's very fast now see uh, this. And you see already my data is going to start reporting errors. Whoops. 
So which region? Oh, I mean Oregon. Up, oh, wrong region. So you see now my uh, API is starting to uh, see failures of this endpoint. So that means uh, my system is going to start thinking that, oh, there is a lot of mistakes. And let's start to fail over. And the system, when it uh, checks an API, it checks the API from six different regions currently and three availability zones. So that means 18, 18 different endpoints. So we, uh, we wait that all 18 of them will fail. Okay? So that means we uh, have to wait a little bit, 10 seconds distributed. So that actually goes quite fast. And actually, you'll see now the system is already uh, unhealthy. So that means all my traffic will be pushed to one region. So let's verify. Let's go there, and let's move more traffic. And let's redo the whole thing. And then I can start checking the DynamoDB table. And you'll see, eventually, all my items whoops, will be in West 2. All right. So that means there's a demo issue. What? <laughs> what? What is happening? Is my traffic? Am I in the right? That's interesting. Route 53, this, I'm unhealthy. This is my west, so it should go all the traffic to the east. All right, we agree on that. Why do I have west regions here? Oh, because I was checking in Virginia, because the data is not there, right? So it's not synchronized. All right, so let's check that, items. What the hell is happening? My demo has some issues. All right, let's, let's check this out. So let's go into the code. I have global dev all here. I have this. It's deployed. Let's check my health check. That's interesting. West is deployed 200, 200. Which Lambda function? Did I have the right Lambda functions here? Yes. Let's go into the east. Is dev block, my API gateway is there, 3 VOX. Has anyone spotted some errors that I haven't seen? I give 100%, $100 credits AWS if you find the error with me. $100, $1,000, let's bring the, the stakes up. It's probably an error in my uh, environment variable somewhere. What's up? Sorry, I don't, what's that? Yeah, let's reload that just to see. Because the DynamoDB, uh, yeah, it's, it's reloading the right ish, the right stuff. So, okay, let's delete all the items here and see what's happening. Why? Actually, let's go in Lambda here and see that my code really has the, the get. Especially, I want to see the get, right? So, function. But hey, just trust me, it works, right? It's the first time the demo fails, it's funny. I probably uh, did something wrong to it a uh, few, few uh, check. So did I change the, no, it's the global two. $1,000, guys, I tell you. Come up with the right thing. What's up? Do you have a microphone? Route. Ah, there is the smart. Did I have the right, the wrong health checks here on my traffic policies? So my traffic policy here. So health check. The health check seven. 7E, it goes to West. 
Health check, seven he goes to west. Hey, it's to your right. Woo. You, just, you just earned yourself a lot of credits, awesome. So yeah, the error here, as you, uh, as you very well spotted, was that my traffic policy uh, has a wrong API health check. So it has a health check from the wrong region. So very well spotted. Um, so yeah, it works. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, anyway, if you want to uh, read uh, all that from a blog post and see all the code, it's actually on Medium and my uh, GitHub account. I've uh, done that uh, from scratch, so you can follow all the code, you can follow all the explanations. There's three series of blog posts, and it also tells you how to do this within a VPC, so if you want to deploy DynamoDB with a VPC endpoint and all that kind of stuff. Not everything is supported, so for example, uh, Cognito authentication doesn't yet support uh, multi-region, so when you, if you want to use Cognito, you need to take uh, create object in one, uh, in one region and create the, the same user pool in the other one. You can do this through a Lambda, but anyway, what uh, I just want to finish with is, a few years ago, it took engineering teams of 20 people and a few months to create that kind of things. And now we can uh, do this in a couple of minutes when you have good guys that can debug code. All right, thanks very much, have a good day. And remember,